Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Institutionalized Racism and Inequity, Turning the Mirror Inward in Your District. This is Poonam Janeja with Public Council, and I'm happy to be joined today by Joyce James, who is the former head of the state of Texas's Child Protective Services Program, where she introduced a model that reduced racial disparities among children placed in foster care in that state, a model that has proven effective at addressing institutionalized racism in other systems, including in schools. Before I turn it over to Ms. James to share this model approach with us today and how it can be applied in schools, I'd like to run through a few housekeeping matters. We will try to have questions at the end of um, time for questions at the end of today's presentation. Because we are recording this session to make it available on the Fix School Discipline website later on, all participants today will be muted. Um, but if you would like to submit questions and you're viewing this on a computer, you can do that using the chat function, which is located in the toolbar on the right side of your browser. You can use that function to send questions directly to me at any time during the presentation. Again, we will hold those for the end of the presentation and then um, hopefully have time to get to them. So now, without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. James. Thank you so much, and um, good morning to some and good afternoon to others. I appreciate the opportunity to do this presentation, and I want to thank Public Council for inviting me. Um, due to the limited time we have for a discussion on a, on a topic that certainly requires a lot of dialogue, uh, I'm going to just get right into the presentation and ask you to please advance to the next slide. I'm going to be um, sharing some key observations about racial inequities and the importance of what I call a groundwater analysis. And the first observation is that racial inequity looks the same across systems. And I will be sharing some data to reflect that. Uh, secondly, that systems contribute significantly to disparities. And we will be having some discussion about how that happens uh, and how we examine the way in which systems contribute. Thirdly, and very important, is the fact that systems level disparities cannot be explained by a few bad apples. So in spite of the, the fact that we may um, rid our systems of some people that uh, who we can see may not be contributing in the way that we want uh, them to contribute and not produce any kind of outcomes that we'd like to see, that in itself doesn't usually change the outcomes. And we'll talk more about that as well. We also know that poor outcomes are concentrated in certain geographic communities, usually poor communities and communities of color. And we have to get in touch with our often biased attitudes and assumptions about why that is. And just to say that if we really look at it closely, we can often trace those outcomes down to the community level as well as to the zip code level in many communities. Uh, lastly, uh, the hope that we can have in knowing that systemic interventions and training, uh, that these things are working to change thinking, reduce disparities, and improve outcomes for all populations. Next slide. At the foundation of any effort to address institutionalized racism and racial inequities, uh, there must be the, re uh, the realization that racial inequities exist across systems. So this slide actually uh, shows some terms that are used by systems to describe racial inequities in their systems. And so just to have you become familiar with some of the language that I will be using in this presentation. Uh, the first word there in regard to disproportionality is a term that is generally used in the child welfare system. And it is used to define the overrepresentation of a particular race or group in a system as compared to their representation in the general population. Uh, we also talk about disparities in health. And when we talk about health disparities, we are talking about those preventable differences in the burden of disease, disability, or opportunities to achieve optimal health. And we could spend a lot of time talking about that definition, but what I want you to key in uh, onto is the word preventable. 
And so just kind of keep that in mind that health disparities are preventable. In juvenile justice, they use the language disproportionate minority contact. And this refers to the disproportionate number of minority youth who come into contact with the juvenile justice system. Now, data indicates that uh, youth are referred to juvenile justice at pretty similar rates across racial lines. However, when you look at the data in systems, what we see is that youth of color are more likely to be adjudicated, sent to state lockup, and more likely to be certified to stand trial as adults, often for the same offenses that are committed by their white peers. And then there's the term that I would imagine many of you are familiar with, which is the achievement gap. And that's the term that's used in the education system. In addition to the definition here, the observed disparity on a number of educational measures between the performance of groups of students, um, we are also going to be talking about disproportionality and disciplinary referrals that result in more in-school suspensions, out-of-school suspensions, and referrals to alternative schools and to juvenile justice, uh, primarily for African American and the Hispanic Latino population. And so we're going to discuss a study that was done in Texas by Texas A&M University, and it is on discipline uh, in the public schools, and we'll talk more about that. I also want to key in on the terms equality and equity, because I think it's important in understanding racial inequities and addressing uh, institutional and structural racism to really think about how we uh, approach our work. And often, we assume that if we treat everybody equal, uh, that that's fair and should result in uh, the potential for good outcomes for everyone. But in my experience, I have found it necessary to really approach this work from a place of equity, the concept that everyone should be treated in a way that uh, meets their specific needs so that they have a fair opportunity to truly attain their potential. Uh, when we don't approach our work from that place of equity, uh, we actually discount uh, the importance of history and culture and other factors that may influence outcomes for, uh, for some populations. And so it's very, very important that we understand the difference uh, between these two things. Okay, next slide. So eliminating disproportionality and disparities in systems really requires a transformation of systems. And what you see here is a diagram that just talks about the fact that the systems and institutions as we know them today, uh, the ones that I just shared and the terms that they use to describe racial inequities are actually decades old. Uh, and a lot of time when we're trying to have conversations about the outcomes that systems produce, and especially when we link it to institutional and or structural racism, uh, many times we'll find ourselves saying, well, you know, these things have been in place long before us. We didn't have anything to do with how they were created or designed. And we have to acknowledge that systems are decades old and that they have been in place uh, oftentimes longer than, than many of us have been in the profession that we're in. But it is important for us to understand uh, the design of systems. Uh, the fact that systems were designed to resist change and that when we talk about institutionalizing something, which is what institutions do, uh, that it is put in place to, to stand, to stay, and to, uh, to really not change. And that's some of what we have seen happen not only in the education system, but in many of the other systems that are set up to, to serve vulnerable populations. Uh, the other thing that we know about our systems is that they can often uh, feel lot oppressive to, to many of the communities that they serve. And so uh, oppression of uh, certain populations and communities really shows out in the data uh, and outcomes that systems produce for some populations, namely poor communities and communities of color. Uh, 
And so it's important for us to understand that uh, there's a sense that people feel oppressed in spite of the fact that they may have access uh, today to some of the systems and institutions that they have not historically had access to. Another important aspect of oppression is for people who work inside of systems and institutions, it's also important for us to understand that systems can also feel like oppression or oppress the people that work inside of them. So that in spite of how well-meaning we are and, and how much we want to do things different, that because of the way systems have been designed and their resistance to change, that it's often difficult to introduce new um, uh, creative and, and innovative models that we think may be beneficial, but that systems uh, uh, do not uh, allow and, and uh, create the kind of culture and environment that would allow us to bring this new thinking into the system. The, the last thing that I want to say about this uh, model and this design, and we could probably do a whole workshop on just this piece, but the importance of acknowledging that the systems and institutions as we know them were designed by whites, for whites, to the exclusion of all other people until a recent time in history. And we, we often, uh, you know, have, have uh, allowed ourselves to think of this in terms of it being a very, very long time ago. But if we have an honest dialogue about this, we know that it has not been that long ago since systems and institutions uh, were legally, uh, could legally not serve uh, other people, that they only were uh, designed to serve whites. And so the importance of this is that when we look at the data and outcomes for our systems, what we see, if we're really honest and courageous in a discussion, is that our systems and institutions are doing exactly what they were designed to do. Uh, and I'm going to show uh, some data, uh, but if you look at data for your systems, you will see that whites have the best outcomes in systems. And this is in no way uh, to say that our systems are operating as well as they should for any population. But we do have to be conscious and aware of the fact that the system is working uh, better for those that it was designed to work for and that it is not working as well for other populations. Okay, go to the next slide, please. So I want us to look at some cross-based systems data that I believe is critical in understanding the relationship of systems to each other and to the same populations and communities. <clears throat> I believe this data emphasizes the importance of shifting our response. Um, oftentimes we have responded uh, to, to data and outcomes uh, in a way that is about fixing the people uh, and not having that deeper examination of the systems and institutions that, as I previously mentioned, have historically and still to do today produce poor outcomes across all systems for the same population. And so this impact, as I stated earlier, can often be traced to the community and zip code level. So though this is Texas data that I, that I have on this screen, uh, I believe that it is reflective of how systems operate in relation to poor communities and communities of color across our nation. And I would challenge you to examine this data uh, for your state or county, regardless to where, where you are. Because one of the things that we know about disproportionality and disparities and racial inequities is that they're not confined to any one part of the state or one part of the country, uh, that if we really examine them, we see them everywhere and we see them in all of our systems. So this graph shows measures from five systems. And it includes two measures for each system listed across the x-axis. 
It includes things like CPS removal, the number of children in foster care. It speaks to preterm births and deaths from diabetes. And all of the measures are relative rate indices for, uh, and this makes for a more simple comparison. And so what we see here is the indication of how many more times more likely than whites is another group to appear in each of these categories. And so the red line represents the white population as the base group. And I think that this is really profound in terms of what this graph uh, uh, shows. And it shows that African Americans are roughly eight times more likely than whites to have preterm birth, and Hispanics are about two times as likely. Uh, it shows that African Americans are about twice as likely to die from diabetes. And when we look at measures from all of the systems together, what we find is pretty, pretty striking in that across all the measures, African Americans are at least two times more likely than whites to have poor outcomes. And that on most measures, they are three to eight times more likely to have poor outcomes. Now, the fact that African Americans uh, fare so poorly in every system suggest to me that we either have to believe that there is something inherently wrong with African Americans as a people, or we have to begin to do what I refer to as turning the mirror inward towards an examination of the systems and their response to vulnerable populations. And so it, it's important for us to examine this by um, you know, looking at the, the, the groundwater approach and that analysis, but it's also uh, important to really begin to expand our thinking on this in a way that says, if we only saw this happening in one system, maybe we could attribute it to the individuals. But the fact that it is everywhere requires that we do a deeper examination and, again, that we turn the mirror inward and we'd be willing to examine those systemic factors in our policy and practice and other areas that contribute to these outcomes. Next slide, please. Now, I want to begin to have a little bit more focused discussion on education, but I shared the other information because I think it is important regardless of the health and profession we're in, that we begin to understand the relationship that the population of people we serve have to other systems. Because oftentimes we will find uh, that students, especially those who will come from poor communities and communities of color, are in relationship with multiple helping systems. And it, it really helps to, to change our lens and our understanding uh, of this when we can uh, see it from the perspective of what is happening to them in other systems. So I'm sorry, but my screen has gone blank. Okay, it's back. <laughs> okay, yeah, it seems it's like back. it's showing up for everyone else okay um, at this point. But yeah, please let me know if that happens again. Thanks. Okay, all right. So I want to spend some time talking specifically about breaking schools' rules. And it was a comprehensive study of discipline in Texas public schools. Uh, and, and if you all have not read that study and others that have been done uh, at the national level uh, since that time, I think it is really, really important in terms of our beginning to approach the issue of disproportionality in school discipline and it's the impact that it has on other outcomes uh, for students. And so researchers looked at disciplinary records from nearly one million students. And by combining data sets from different agencies, the Justice Center and Texas A&M Public Policy Research Institute were able to examine 83 different variables that fall into the categories that you see here. So demographics, 
student attributes, academic performance, discipline contact, campus measures, cohort measures, county measures, and various other measures that added up to 83 factors. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. Okay, this chart summarizes the initial findings. So what, what it really shows is that mandatory discipline outcomes are comparable, but discretionary discipline is hugely, is hugely disparate. So if you can see this chart, and I'm not so sure how well you can see it, but um, African Americans and Hispanics are significantly more likely to receive discretionary discipline. And when I'm doing uh, workshops as it relates to racial inequities, I spend a lot of time talking about uh, the why we see such a vast difference uh, in the discretionary discipline and helping uh, educators and other systems leaders to really begin to examine the why of that. And so around 77% of African Americans receive discretionary discipline, uh, while only 48% of whites do. Now, if you can see the little bitty bars at the top, mandatory discipline is nearly the same across racial lines. We do see some variation with whites at 5.3%, uh, African Americans at 7.2% and Hispanics at 7.9%. But when staff discretion is taken out of the equation, we see much less uh, variation uh, in this data. And so this, this is just really, really powerful uh, in terms of seeing the difference between what happens when there are clear guidelines, because we know that for mandatory disciplinary action, that these are based on certain uh, behaviors, uh, and that there are clear guidelines, even some statutory requirements related to when mandatory discipline must be administered. And we know also that discretionary uh, dis discipline uh, does, does not often come with a set of guidelines or rules that there's been uh, some changes in, in moving towards that. But one of the things we know is that uh, this is based primarily on uh, attitude and assumptions and the way in which we have been socialized to view uh, and respond to, to behaviors that may often be uh, the same. Uh, but because of the messages that we have internalized about certain groups, it may result um, in, in a difference in the way that we approach it. So let's move to the next slide. Okay. So the most striking finding came when the researchers controlled against 83 factors that might influence disciplinary action. And I want to read just this is from the executive summary. So multivariate analysis, which enabled researchers to control for 83 different variables in isolating the effect of race alone on disciplinary action, found that African American students had a 31% higher likelihood of a school discretionary action compared to otherwise identical white and Hispanic students. Now, what is particularly interesting is that when you look here at mandatory control for these factors, you can see that African American students are actually less likely to commit offenses like aggravated assault or bringing a weapon to school that led to mandatory action. So this really goes to the core of why it is important for us to understand institutional and structural racism. And so how do we engage in bold and courageous conversations about the impact of racial inequities in discipline and the root causes 
you know, if, and I know that it's been challenging in my work uh, with educators to admit that disproportionality in discipline is not just about bad behavior on the part of students. And actually, this research speaks to that fact. You know, some of the variables included making the conduct the same, the socioeconomic status the same, the school performance the same, previous accounting for previous disciplinary actions. And the bottom line in this study is that all factors considered, race is a predictor of discipline. And so we know that school discipline leads to greater contact with juvenile justice. As a matter of fact, this study showed that students who are recipients of multiple discipline are three times more likely to be referred to the juvenile justice system. It shows that they're more likely to repeat a grade it also shows that they're more likely to drop out. And so one of the reasons in the beginning where I talked about the importance of understanding the relationship with other systems is that it's important for us to understand how disproportionality in discipline can also lead to disproportionality in high school completion rates, it can lead to disproportionality in juvenile justice. And we know that young people who are involved in the juvenile justice system also have a higher likelihood of going on to becoming involved in the criminal justice system. So it can also lead to disproportionality in the juvenile in the criminal justice system. Now if one of if the impact of discipline is also uh, dropout, we can also look to our data across the country and trace dropout rates by race back to the disproportionality in terms of which students are being disciplined. And so we know, for example, that the same students who are disproportionately disciplined are the same students who are disproportionately dropping out, disproportionately in juvenile justice. If you don't have a high school diploma, uh, we know that later in life that determines what kind of job you will have, uh, where you can live and raise your family, your access to services and resources, and it also impacts your health outcomes. And so we know that there is a relationship even there uh, between health disparities and education. And so it, it's just really important that we begin to examine and understand these issues uh, in a way that's more than about what's wrong with the students or their parents, uh, which I term that as focusing on uh, fixing broken people versus being courageous and bold and willing to examine systemic factors and focus on fixing broken systems. And so there has to be a move and a shift toward um, more than the one-sided conversation that I have experienced when I've gone in to work with not only educators but child welfare and juvenile justice and health professionals. Uh, for so long we have been talking about it in terms of what's wrong with the community or what's wrong with the people or why can't they benefit from uh, the services and programs that we have put, put in place for them uh, that we have not been as willing to have the other side of the conversation so that at least there's mutual accountability for the outcomes uh, that we're seeing uh, in our systems. Next slide, please. I hope this is, is really, you know, invoking some, provoking some deeper thinking around these issues. Um, 
I want to move into a model that I used uh, in the state of Texas uh, when I started doing this work in child welfare. What I want to say is that in the state of Texas, uh, the undoing racism training by the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond uh, was provided to thousands of systems leaders and community partners. And in my leadership role in Texas and in the work I currently do as a consultant on these issues, um, I, I find it necessary because it was so important. Uh, I find it necessary to, to, to lift up the fact that this training has served as a foundation for my success in raising the level of consciousness of child welfare, education, juvenile justice, health, university, and community college leaders regarding racial inequities and the fact that they are a symptom of a much deeper issue. And so in, in, my, in the past, you know, I haven't always been where I am in this work either, and, and one of the things that I willingly do is make myself vulnerable in this process when I'm doing work uh, with systems uh, because, you know, I have been in a position myself to try to treat the symptom of the problem and really being frustrated with the fact that people just weren't getting it or they, wouldn't, they weren't making progress, but coming to know that we won't have the change we desire just by treating the symptom is a result of the many, many times that I have engaged in, been engaged in the Undoing uh, Racism workshop. Um, it provided a common language and understanding of how racism came to be so that as I began to lead this work and help others in this work, we could work from a common ag agenda to, un to undo institutional and structural racism. And this is the framework uh, for the work that I do today. So I speak to raising the consciousness because I believe that we have to approach this work from the belief that uh, educators and child welfare and health and juvenile justice professionals uh, do not approach their work with the intent to harm or to hurt. Uh, I believe we come to our work to help. Uh, and that there is no intent uh, to approach it with malice or hate towards the affected population. But one of the things that I know deeply and, and that I've experienced and that continues to give me hope in this work is that when well-meaning people become conscious, they develop a racial equity lens that then becomes a force for the transformation of systems. And we will only have equity when we begin to realize that getting to equity requires systems transformation. Sorry, I had to take a little sip of water. <coughs> so um, this is the, the Texas model. I want to introduce you to it. <coughs> it was created under my leadership when I was head of Child Protective Services for the state of Texas. And it was also expanded uh, when I became head of the Center for Elimination of Disproportionality and Dis Disparities, as well as the head of the Texas State Office of Minority Health. Uh, the design of the model is such that uh, it is applicable to any system seeking to reduce racial inequities and improve outcomes uh, for all populations. And so these are the components of the model. So the first being data-driven strategies. The importance of collecting all data researched, evaluated, and reported by race and ethnicity. And the importance of that is that when we don't do that, then we do not know whether or not our system is uh, and our programs are effectively serving all populations. So we also have to compare data to the racial and ethnic populations of a defined area. And we have to examine it from a systemic and cross-systems perspective. 
And we also have to share this data transparently with systems and the communities that are affected by the data outcome. Now, oftentimes, our data, we're so uh, not satisfied with the outcomes indicated to us by our data that we don't want to share it. But a lot of times it's important for us to share it so that there is mutual accountability among all the parties in getting to the outcomes that we want. And then there's the, the, the leadership development piece, which, which I think is so critical uh, in systems. And, and it's, it's around growing leaders that are grounded in anti-racist principles, uh, leaders who are courageous, leaders who understand and are addressing their own internalized racial oppression, leaders who know why people are poor from a place other than that they're lazy and like living off the system, uh, leaders who are accountable to the people they serve, to their staff, to their institutions, leaders who can recognize their role as gatekeepers and therefore uh, recognize that they are part of the system and that they strive to be good keep gatekeepers through transparency and humility and leaders who are willing to support internally and externally individuals within the same leadership framework. And so how that connects to the data is that most systems and institutions may have their data broken down by race and ethnicity, but are they bringing leadership to the table to ask questions about the why of the data and to be willing to examine it at the groundwater level, to be willing to examine it and consider all of the factors uh, and really get into the core of the problem rather than the symptom. And then there is the culturally competent workforce. And, you know, we really have to move from cultural competency to racial equity. But this is about developing a workforce where everyone is trained in anti-racist principles and where their humanity demonstrates best practice through service delivery and access to programs and services. Uh, staff who can review and examine their work through that anti-racist lens and whose primary focus is to ensure equity while improving outcomes in partnership with other systems that touch the same vulnerable population. And that really speaks to the community engagement piece. Uh, and if there's time uh, over this presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the community engagement piece. But it's important to engage the grassroots community through transparency uh, in communication that is respectful. Uh, that we really recognize the strengths of the community. And for educators, your community will be uh, your parents and your students, but it will also be people who live in the communities where parents and students live, and all others who have an interest in ensuring good outcomes uh, for all students. And so the importance of hearing their ideas and including them, including parents, including youth, students, and including other citizens in the dialogue and discussions and planning and decision making on the efforts and the programs that will be put in place to impact them and their communities. You know, oftentimes we find ourselves, uh, because we're well-meaning and well-intentioned, uh, designing programs and services uh, that are meant to do good, but we do it in isolation of the people who will be impacted. And then when our programs and services don't produce the outcomes that we want, uh, as I said earlier, uh, we point fingers outward instead of inward. And then there's the cross-systems collaboration, uh, the importance of identifying and building relationships and partnerships with parents and other systems and institutions and those agencies whose services, programs, policies, and practices impact the same or similar population. I know in particular in schools that are predominantly poor and communities of color, 
uh, that it's important to understand uh, the connection to the, those other systems and institutions and be in relationship with them as a way to break down the barriers that get in the way of, of good outcomes in, in all of those systems. Then there's the, uh, the training defined by anti-racism principles. Uh, you know, we have to believe that all parties involved in the process to achieve racial equity should be trained in anti-racist principles. And in the work that I've done, uh, we base this training again on the principles uh, which come from the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. And they include things like learning from history. And that was part of the the design of systems that I, that I showed. So there's a history that's decades old uh, regarding our institutions. And it's important that we learn from that history and understand uh, how that still applies today. Uh, the importance of developing leadership, of maintaining accountability to communities, of creating networks, and of undoing internalized racial oppression. Uh, and I hope that you all uh, are familiar with, with that term of internalized racial oppression uh, and how it manifests in, in people in different ways, in some groups as internalized racial inferiority and in others as internalized racial superiority. It's important to understand that in terms of how then we may even make decisions about discretionary discipline. So all these principles are important in helping us to understand uh, what we use and, and, and where we draw from to make decisions when we may not have those written guidelines to rely upon. And so using these principles to guide our work is necessary to ensure that we are addressing the problem at the institutional and cultural level in addition to addressing uh, the symptoms of racism. And then lastly, uh, an understanding of the history of institutional racism and its impact on poor communities and communities of color. And so in developing this model, it really required that we approach our work with a sense of how we got here. Because the outcomes that we see in our systems are a result of a particular historical process. And to change them, we have to understand the history. Doing so will lead to a greater understanding, accountability, and willingness to turn in the mirror inward, to examining institutional racism at a groundwater level, which will lead to the transformation of systems, which is what well-meaning and well-intentioned professionals want to see. This is why we have chosen to do the work that we do, to have some positive contribution to impact in the lives of those populations that are served by our profession. Next slide, please. So I want to show you uh, some impact uh, results of the Texas model. Okay, so the model led to a statewide decrease in removal of African American uh, and Hispanic, well, it actually led to a decrease in removal for all populations between 2005 and 2010. And over a period of time, it improved outcomes for all populations. And I show you this to say that in our work, regardless to what system it is, we use data to guide and direct us as to where we should be focusing. And what we know from data is that for our, almost all of our systems, I don't know of any that's producing better outcomes uh, for African Americans and Hispanics than, than for whites. So when we focus on those who are least likely, to have the outcomes that we want, what we see is a system that gets better for all people. And that is the ultimate goal uh, of our work. 
uh, it is to not assume that the system is working as well as it should for any group, but to recognize that when we raise the bar for those who are least likely to achieve the outcomes that we desire, that we actually raise the bar for everyone. And this shows uh, that decrease for all populations in the rate of removal uh, and children being placed in foster care. As a matter of fact, as a result of using that model, uh, we saw more children for the first time exiting foster care than coming in. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide uh, just shows, you know, a lot of times uh, in the beginning we would hear people say, well, you're going to put African American or Native American children at risk if you go out and and try to design a model that tells staff not to remove, which is not at all what we were doing. Uh, we were focusing on safety first, but we were also examining at the groundwater level uh, those factors that contributed to, even when all things were equal, more removals of African American and Native American uh, children. And so this shows that there was no significant increase in ma repeated maltreatment as a result of the model being um, uh, implemented. And what I want to say is here that I don't have any research yet to confirm this, but I have a strong sense that using this model to reduce racial inequities in discipline and in student outcomes, but especially in discipline, that it would not put schools at a higher risk in regard to safety. And, you know, the fact is that the majority of the disciplinary actions that are taken are not due to those serious acts of violence. And so I, I believe that it's safe to say that putting a model in place that would effectively uh, reduce uh, discipline uh, and the racial inequities associated with it would not compromise uh, the safety of the school. Next slide. And can I do a quick time check, please? Yes. Um, we're currently, it's currently um, 11.17 here. So we have about 43 minutes left. Okay. So we're good. Okay. So, um, uh, this just continues to show uh, the impact of the model, and, and I would ask you, though this uh, information and the data is from child welfare, to remember uh, the components of the model and their applicability to all systems that are working to reduce uh, racial inequities. And so there are a number of data that suggest that the model is primarily responsible for the results that you see here. Um, so in five of the focus counties that are highlighted in green is where we began the community engagement process over two years before the rest of the state. And on the top right, uh, we see the change in rate of removal for African Americans and for whites in those focus counties versus the change for all counties. And what we see is that the rate of removal for white and African Americans decreased at least twice as much in the counties where we were using the model as it did in the state at large. Um, and, and so we also know uh, that when schools are in relationship with parents and the communities, that the result is improved student success. And so I believe that we can make, uh, you know, we can compare uh, in terms of uh, in, engaging the community, which was a huge component of the model uh, in those particular focused areas where the community was engaged, uh, and a lot of work went on into including the voices of parents and, and youth and, and other community partners and systems that resulted in a more positive impact in those focus counties than in the state as a whole. And so I would assume 
uh, that you would see that, well, I believe that there's research out there that actually shows that when schools have uh, uh, the engagement of parents in the community, that that has a positive impact on student outcomes. Okay, next slide. Okay, uh, I want, and then this is somewhat related to, to education uh, because it's really about a project that I lay, led that was funded by the Children's Justice Act, and it was on uh, looking at mandatory reporters. And one of the things that we found in Texas, and I think it's true across the country, is that educators are the highest reporters of abuse and neglect. And so um, what we were doing here is actually uh, a pilot where we developed uh, a pre-post survey to administer to reporters in, in certain parts of the state and in, in several districts. And then we had uh, in the pre-test, we had about 160 educators, and in the post-test, we had 144. And we used uh, some open-ended questions that were answered uh, with a scale response ranging from strongly agree to strongly disagree. And the results of the scale questions were highly favorable. So three-fourths, about 78%, were in initial agreement, strongly or agree with the statement that they had received training within the past two years that had increased their knowledge and understanding of cultural competency and diversity. Now, after the training, everyone was in agreement. We had about a 20% change from pre the training to post the training. And what I want to say here is that as we are doing this work around disciplinary actions and racial inequities in student outcomes, that we're seeing a similar response in the pre and post in that before the four-hour training session, uh, people are not quite uh, understanding the role of race and the role of institutional racism uh, as it relates to some of the outcomes that they're seeing. But afterwards, in just four hours, we're seeing a tremendous shift uh, in terms of the understanding uh, related to that. So let's go to the next slide. OK. So this just has some points about the, the initial pilot and some of the questions that we were trying to get to here. Again, we wanted to know who had had training within the past two years that increased their knowledge. Uh, we wanted to know if training had changed their knowledge about institutional racism. And you see the pre-post percentages there. Uh, what disproportionality is, and you, it could be about any system. So you could move child welfare and put education or health or juvenile justice. Uh, having a clear understanding of the impact reporters have on disproportionality. You see the change there, 45% change. Uh, how cultural competency impacts the decision uh, making pro uh, the decision making process. You know, one of the things that I think is important to mention here is that. As we went into uh, all 20 education service centers in the state of Texas to address disproportionality in the reporting of abuse and neglect by educators who were the highest uh, reporters, we went in first of all, I want to be clear that we went in first of all to, uh, to really emphasize uh, the requirement, the, the, the legal requirement, the statutory requirement that educators have to report child abuse and neglect. So that was the first piece of this, is to really make sure that people knew that addressing disproportionality was not about compromising child safety. 
but that their first priority was to uh, comply with the law to report child abuse and neglect. But as we went in to deliver this training and to do uh, activities and exercises and pre present data that raised the level of consciousness, uh, what we found is that in just a short while, uh, school nurses and counselors and edu other educators could really get in touch at a conscious level with disproportionality. We knew, for example, that African American families were being reported at two to three times their rate in the general population. Yet when those reports reached uh, our child abuse hotline where they made the decision about which ones would be accepted for an investigation, we began to see less disproportionality in terms of which ones were investigated. So that told us that there was something going on even in the reporting. Just want to share with you just a, just a couple of comments that came uh, from some of the participants. One uh, couple in, uh, in particular. So after becoming conscious, we had people who would say, well, I've been in a position where I've had some concern about something going on with the child. And for some children, I would pick up the phone and call their parents and ask them what happened to the child. And for other parents, I would make a report to the hotline. Not malicious, not taking the time to really think about it, but really having to get to that place where we could examine the impact of institutional and structural racism, the impact of internalized oppression, and how it plays out in all of us. Because one of the things that I haven't said that I really think is important for you to hear me say is that the decisions that are made that impact the data and outcomes for the same populations in all of our health and systems, those decisions are made by people of all races. And so it's not just about one group, but it is about our willingness to come together and to engage in those bold and courageous conversations that help us to understand the why of this so that we can work together from that common language and common definition and common understanding of how institutional and structural racism manifests itself so we can work together from that place in a way that would allow us to achieve the outcomes uh, that we would like to achieve. And so, uh, you know, we heard uh, people talk about how it helped this kind of training help to pull back the curtain on the unwritten, nonverbal, confrontational acts of racism. These are words that came from the valuations and the surveys that the educators completed. That it opened their eyes and it helped them to look at the heart and realize that they, that's where they should be looking. Uh, almost all of the responders were interested in participating uh, in a full uh, Undoing Racism uh, workshop, which was the last question that we had on the survey. But it increased their awareness. It increased their understanding. Um, it also increased the courage within them to engage others in similar discussions uh, that might impact the institutions that they worked in. And so um, doing this kind of work is, uh, it requires what I call a, a, a willingness to, to often go to those uncomfortable conversations. Uh, uh, but it makes it a whole lot easier uh, when we can approach those discussions uh, from a common definition. Because one of the things that we talk about is the fact that when we talk about this in the workshop, is that we probably all have our own definitions about what institutional and structural racism is, especially what racism is. Because our definition is based on our own experiences and you know, our culture and history and values and those things that we have been taught. 
And even the way we receive messages and how we internalize those messages shape what that means for us. And so when we can come together uh, in a liberated space and have the kind of dialogue that breaks down uh, the defensiveness and the denials and the that's not my truth kinds of uh, things that take place, then we create what I call that space to be able to really get to uh, that deeper discussion uh, that goes beyond the surface, that goes beyond the symptoms, and get to the core uh, of these issues. Next slide, please. So this is a list of the anti-racism principles which I've already talked uh, some about. Um, they were developed by the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. And, and what I want you as professionals to hear from me as a professional uh, is that it is these principles and the willingness to integrate them into every aspect of my work with systems and institutions that has contributed to my ability to lead and to develop the leadership of others who come to see their work through a racial equity lens. And so I do encourage uh, that we be willing to get out of our comfort zone, uh, that we be willing to be uncomfortable for the sake of the work that we have chosen to do. Um, and so we have to be able to see uh, institutional and structural racism at the groundwater level. And we have to ultimately respond from that level, uh, again, rather than continuing to try uh, to address the symptoms. And you, you'll just see some of the principles here are undoing racism, uh, that racism is the single most critical barrier to building effective coalitions for social change, uh, the belief that it has been consciously and systematically erected and therefore it can be undone if people understand what it is, where it comes from, and how it functions and how and why it is perpetuated. And then learning from history. Uh, you know, and understanding the lessons of history uh, really allows us to, to create that more humane future that we all want. Then sharing culture, uh, developing leadership, anti-racist leadership has to be developed intentionally and systematically within local communities and within systems. And so oftentimes uh, we have people who work in systems who really do all the right things. I want to acknowledge that. But that helps some of your students. And so until we have a system that is developed and designed to promote equity for everyone, then it's not enough to really hold on to the old saying that if we just help one. Because we really should be working to transform our systems so that they operate for good outcomes for all people. And so that developing leaders uh, who understand that, uh, who are willing to be vulnerable in that process, who are willing to role model, who are willing to give the OK to have conversations about institutional and structural racism, uh, and know that that is critical and important uh, if we are to have equity. And then maintaining accountability. Uh, organizing with integrity requires that we have to be accountable to the communities that struggle with racist oppression. And for educators, that means being accountable to the students and their parents and the communities in which they reside. It also means it can being accountable for understanding their history and the history of their relationships with the institutions. So it's very, very key. And then networking analyzing power uh, and under, understanding internalized racial oppression uh, and identifying and, and analyzing. And so recognizing that uh, when we talk about racism in this sense, we're in no way talking about individual acts of meanness, hatred, and bigotry. And when we understand that, we can often break down the barriers to having the conversation. So if we can get all of that out of the way, because what we know, as I 
said earlier in the very beginning that um, it can't be attributed to a few bad apples. So we could rid the education system and other systems of all of those people that we could point to and see outward acts of racism and say we're going to get rid of them. And it wouldn't change the data and the outcomes in our system because it's not about those acts of racism in the sense that we have generally know, uh, thought of them. But it is more about understanding how all of us, being well-meaning and well-intentioned, are part of institutional and structural racism that's built into the very fabric and core of our systems and institutions. It's unraveling that and understanding it in a way that allows us to be lifted to that place where we can now see through a racial equity lens. Next slide, please. Just briefly, the community engagement framework, this is actually a four-stage uh, process that is highly inclusive. And uh, it's reliant on a facilitative leadership process. Uh, it requires a cross-systems approach. Uh, it requires engaging community leaders uh, in the decisions. And it also um, uh, requires the commitment of resources for sustainability. You know, in this work to address racial inequities, uh, it has to be a priority for us. And if it's a priority, then we will find ways to, to, to have the resources and, and the funds and, and all of the other things that need to be put in place, including training, uh, to make it happen. Um, I developed the framework for this model um, over 20 years ago when I was a regional manager. Uh, when I came to recognize the importance of engaging those persons most impacted by the work of the system that I was leading, uh, I came to recognize that in isolation of their voices and the voice of other community members, that our policies and our practices were not fully informed. And then about 12 years ago, uh, when I became the head of Child Protective Services for the state of Texas, uh, the model was expanded uh, to be used in impact and racial inequity statewide. And I want to give credit to a partnership that we had with Casey Family Programs and the then director of strategic consulting, uh, Carolyn Rodriguez. Uh, together we work uh, to implement this community engagement framework in every region in the state of Texas. And I want to say that engaging the community in this work included engaging the education system, because we saw the importance of engaging all of those systems who had a relationship with the children, youth, and families that we were serving. And so this model and its components convey the importance of mutual accountability of systems and communities in working together to achieve uh, equity and outcomes for all populations. So if you will just uh, quickly go through to the next slide, uh, I've included uh, some principles from the Aspen Institute. Uh, there are 10 lessons for taking leadership on race. And uh, I would say that you can look those up. And I think they would be good in helping to start a conversation uh, uh, and, and about taking leadership on racial equity. Um, in closing, because I want to have just a few minutes for uh, for questions, um, uh, comments, uh, I want to emphasize that the groundwater approach reflects a new way of thinking. If you'll go to the next slide and the next one. Okay. That the groundwater approach reflects a new way of thinking and of conceptualizing change. And this slide shows some differences between the old and the new way of thinking. Uh, we often feel that outcomes are out of our control, uh, especially since these inequities have existed for so long for the same population of people, for the same population of students. And I often help leaders connect to their sense of numbness around racial inequities and to reach a consciousness 
that re-energizes all of us toward bold and courageous conversations and actions that get us back in touch with why we chose our profession in the first place. And our desire in whatever profession we have chosen to be a part of a system that produces good outcomes, that produces equity for all populations. Uh, lastly, my success in leading work to address racial inequities and the success that I have witnessed as I have trained and provided technical assistance and leadership development sessions in other systems has given me much hope because I have seen the difference that it can make. Uh, the approach that I believe is so critical must be inclusive of a willingness to engage in discussions on race and racism. And, you know, I must admit from my own experience that I haven't always been comfortable with having these conversations, especially across racial lines. But I have come to know that it is necessary for examining old attitudes and assumptions and for becoming consciously aware that race has been for far too long and still is the number one predictor of negative outcomes in all of our health and systems. And I believe that getting it right in the education system can change the negative trajectory into many of the other systems. Thank you. There's Thank you. I just have time. Yes. Okay, so we have um, we have about um, a little bit over 15 minutes for questions. And again, um, people can send us questions using um, the chat function, and those will come to me, and I'll be able to read them um, to Joyce. So we have gotten a few questions through um, the session, and so we'll start asking some of those, and if um, people can go ahead and send any additional questions that they have. Um, so one one question that we received earlier. Um, was just a question about what the meaning was of mandatory versus discretionary discipline violations that you uh, mentioned earlier in the presentation. Okay, yes. So um, educators uh, have guidelines related to certain acts committed on school campuses. So if a student brings a weapon to school or commits physical or sexual assault on campus, there are statutory uh, written guidelines uh, that uh, that warrant that 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 require them to, to take a mandatory discipline. So it's mandatory. There's no discretion. You can't decide not to discipline for those acts. And then discretionary are those things that don't fall. Uh, under those mandatory acts. I mean, it could be talking in class, it could be not being in dress code, it could be various other things that may not have a written guideline, but that are also things for which uh, discipline can be administered. I want to give one example that actually came from uh, the Department of Education and the Office of Civil Rights as one of the things that they have consistently received complaints about. So educators can discipline students for behavior uh, that uh, uh, appears to, uh, to be harmful behavior. And so it's, it's not clear. It just says that if, if there's a suspicion that uh, student behavior appears to be harmful, then they can be disciplined. And one of the things that repeatedly uh, the Department of Education and Office of Civil Rights has gotten complaints about is that students of color have received discipline for things like just gathering together in a group and talking, and that's been considered to be uh, threatening behavior. So that's someone's discretion. OK. Um, another question that we've received is, um, it's a statement and a request that you comment on and discuss this. Um, so the person observed, um, it is really difficult to explain to broad stakeholder groups the complexity of how these systems all work, um, as well as the programs and services and frameworks, how they work. 
Um, this complexity is difficult even for our own leaders with whom we have a little bit more time to distrust, um, to, sorry, to grasp. Um, many community stakeholders also distrust the system, which has failed them. So I think um, the person wanted you to comment on that and share your perspective. Well, first of all, um, that's a good question, let me say. And, and first of all, we have to understand why uh, systems, there's that level of distrust of systems. And when we understand the history of that, uh, we can go into communities um, in a different way. We can invite them in differently. Uh, we can really be willing to, you know, one of the things that I think opens the door to build trust and relationships is the willingness to share our data with communities and with those populations that are impacted. Uh, one of the ways in which, uh, in my leading of the work, that we were able to really kind of get a grasp of these multiple systems is to be in partnership with them. And so to, to bring these various systems and, and key community leaders that maybe we did have a relationship with and to engage them in helping to open the door to relationships with others. Um, one of the approaches was to uh, try to get community leaders that we did have a relationship with to help us set up meetings in community. So not asking people to come to us but actually going out to the community and inviting in your parents or inviting in other community and sharing the data and asking for help. Uh, one other thing that I'll say on that is that when we go into communities, we have generally gone in telling the community what we're going to do for them. I say turning the mirror inward means asking the question and bringing the information differently. So going into community and genuinely communicating to people that we need to know from them what the system can do different. And really keeping that dialogue going and you know reporting back and sharing uh, in a way that begins to build that trust. And I've seen that be very effective. Okay, thank you. Um, another question. Um, that we've received is that um, the information that you've shared on your model, um, they, they were wondering how successful was that in reducing the gaps in um, outcomes for different groups um, as opposed to improving the situation for, across all groups? Well, what I'm most proud of with that work is that we can say that in improved outcomes, we have you know, research that shows and data that shows it improved outcomes for all groups, and at the same time, it reduced disproportionality for Native American and African American children who were disproportionately represented in the Texas foster care system. So it, it had the impact of reducing disproportionality and disparities, and at the same time, improving outcomes for all. And another follow-up question to that was, um, is the model still being used in Texas? Um, why or why not? And how have the pos has the positive impact continued? Um, let me just say that uh, I implemented the model uh, when I became the Child Welfare Director in 2004, and it was uh, in place in that format uh, through 2010, and what I will say is that when the model and its components and anti-racism principles are all at work, that they produce positive outcomes, and when they're not, then you begin to see uh, the system reverting back uh, to its old way of doing business. Okay. Um. Another question um, that has come up a couple of times is um, how do you receive more information on your model? I think that last sheet has my contact information. If you'll go one more slide. Um, and I guess I will also add that we will be sending um, out to the participants here copies of the 
presentation slides, um, in, which include information on how to contact um, Joyce. And just to add, I am working with some school districts, um, large school districts around uh, some of these issues. And that is one of the reasons why I speak to uh, the impact of the model, uh, regardless of the system. Because the underlying factors that influence racial inequities are the same in all systems. OK. And one, um, one additional question um, is that somebody um, asks about how historical trauma plays out with this discussion. If you could comment on that. Well, the, the importance of understanding historical trauma uh, is critical. And, and that speaks to the component of the model that about understanding the history of racism in this country. Um, I, I think I spoke briefly about uh, in the design of the model that we often like to think about think about systems in terms of uh, it, it's been a long time ago since uh, certain groups were excluded uh, from uh, access to these systems and institutions. But we, when we understand the historical trauma associated with race and racism and the impact that it still has today, then it creates a different lens through which we uh, do our work and even through which we view the people that we work with. So it's very, very important uh, in doing this work. OK. Um, so another person asked, given the limited amount of time here, um, are there any things that you um, would like to add specifically that you didn't have time to to share earlier in your presentation? Well, uh, there's a, you know, there's a whole piece around uh, doing uh, racial equity work that has uh, an understanding of institutional and structural racism at its core. Uh, it takes more than us just saying that we want to do good work. Uh, it, it takes going through a process of understanding history and the trauma and what has happened to all of us as a result of racism. And so that's a whole process that people have to go through uh, that I would, you know, that I couldn't even do on the, on the phone in a presentation anyway, because it needs to be an in-person type of facilitated dialogue uh, that brings cross-racial groups together. Uh, to begin to then uh, break down the, the barriers that, that won't let us even talk about race and racism and understand where that comes from. And something that's connected to that, um, someone asked it, that it seems to them um, from this discussion that for this model and the approach that you're taking here, that there needs to be a high-level champion in the institutional level who will be there for a long time. Um, and they ask, is that a fair observation in terms of um, taking this approach to making change? Yeah, and I love that question because I do think it's a fair uh, observation. And one of the things that I, I like to make note of when, when I go out and do this work, and, and, and a lot of times the leaders are not the ones in the room. They tend you know, their line managers and others, and people will inevitably say, oh, how do I get my leader in the room? And, you know, I have to acknowledge that when I started this work at the state level, I was the leader. Uh, and I, I had the support, of course, of some of our legislators who really championed this work and, and created legislation around it. But yes, you need a you need a champion, but more than that, we need to be doing this work long enough to institutionalize it so that it doesn't die when the leader changes. OK, and another question um, that we received was for, um, you had talked before about training and professional development and seeing people reflecting back changes in their, um, in their observations and feelings um, after that. Is there a minimum amount of hours and training that employees would need to go through before you can expect their work practices to change? And I think a connected question is, um, how is that 
maintained on an ongoing basis? Well, first of all, we've seen uh, the impact of uh, four-hour sessions. The work that I'm doing with school districts uh, goes beyond the training. And I really think it takes more than a four-hour or two-day or even a one-week training session. So, but first it takes the willingness to begin the conversation and to work to build capacity within the institution, within the school, uh, to have to develop some, some champions who are able to then uh, help to, to kind of keep the conversation going because as powerful as it is in a work in a training session, we have been so socialized to think differently about these issues that if we're not deliberate and intentional about developing an internal process to keep it going, then we revert right back to our old way of thinking. And so you need to have some support and some assistance to build the capacity so that it lives within the organization and that there are champions identified, though everyone needs to eventually be doing the work. And a follow-up question to your um, prior response. Um, do you have any suggestions for how to get high-level stakeholders to the table to begin these conversations about race? You know, sometimes it takes um, just, I think data is the best way to open these conversations. And so, you know, asking why can we dig a little bit deeper sharing maybe something you've heard on this dialogue with, with, with someone and asking if there is an, an opportunity to maybe examine at a deeper level some of the outcomes that you're seeing uh, in your particular system. I can tell you, uh, and, and I usually, I go out and, and, and actually I do keynotes on my personal journey uh, around this work because there was a time when I struggled with this and knew that there were things that weren't quite the way I thought they should be, but I couldn't find my voice in this work. And so I, like many well-meaning professionals, made a lot of decisions for children, youth, and families when I started my career as a frontline child welfare worker that today I look back on and tell folks that I never would have made those decisions for my own children. And so it's it really, eventually, I had to raise the issue. And what I found is that there are so many people who are just waiting for someone to free them from that struggle that you won't be alone. In my experience, I can tell you that you won't be alone. But somebody has to be willing to raise the question. And I say use data. Okay, um, I think we're about out of time. So are there any concluding thoughts you'd like to share? Well, I would just like to thank you uh, for this opportunity. And I'd like to thank everyone who's on this call. And I would like to challenge folks to just really uh, dig deeper, uh, you know, ask why more than one time. And think about it in terms of what I heard from one of the trainers with the People's Institute who will say, we have to, you know, we have to look at the cause of the cause. You know, assume that maybe there might be something else going on and dig deeper. And I would welcome the opportunity to share uh, any other information with you all. If you reach out, I'll do my best to respond. Okay. Okay, thank you so much um, for your presentation today, and thanks to all of, um, who participated. Um, if you have a question or if your question wasn't answered, please, of course, as Joyce just said, feel free to um, contact her. And you can also email me, um, Poonam Janeja, at pjuneja at publiccouncil.org. Um, we will be sending all participants a link to the recorded webinar and to the slides within a few days. Um, the webinar will also be available on our website, fixschooldiscipline.org. You should receive a short evaluation form at the conclusion of this webinar with just three questions and a space for comments. And we would really appreciate it if you could take a minute to fill it out. Thank you again for attending and have a wonderful day.